Good afternoon and welcome to this Turing Schools application webinar in which we're going to look at the qualitative sections of the Turing application form. My name is Alan Cowie and I will be presenting the webinar today. I'm joined by my colleagues Bethan Everett, Sean James and Irene Leon Alemani who will be monitoring the Q&A live chat. So this afternoon's session, um, the purpose is to familiarise you with the Turing scheme. We will explore how to prepare to apply for funding with a focus on the qualitative sections of the application. We're also going to highlight application resources and further support available. We'll also have plenty of time for questions and answers. If you would like to ask a question, you'll see a chat icon over in the top right hand side of your screen, circled on this slide. Clicking on that will open the Q&A feature where you can post questions as we go along. If you don't mind, it would be helpful if you could include your name when submitting questions. To ask a question, click on Featured and then on Ask a Question. To see all questions that have been asked and the answers, just say just stay in the, the featured section. The section called My Questions will only show your own questions that you've asked. So what is the Turing Scheme? It's our UK's global programme to study and work abroad. It's named in honour of the British scientist Alan Turing and provides funding for international opportunities in education and training across the world. It will provide funding for international mobility of students, learners and pupils, offer exchanges globally and it covers higher education, further education, vocational education and training in schools and it will fund UK and overseas territories beneficiaries for outward mobility only. Tuning allows organisations to provide students, learners and pupils with the chance to develop new skills, gain vital international experience and boost their employability. They can also develop a wide range of soft skills, language skills and a better understanding of other cultures. You can build relationships with international peers and gain fresh ideas. So now we're going to go into more detail about Turing for schools. This is a list of eligible organisations on the screen. I'm not going to go through each one of these as you can see them there, but and the eligibility criteria is also available in the Turing programme guide. A little bit later, we're all going, also going to cover the eligibility of uh, participants and activities and also some grant rates. So which organisations can apply for funding? Either a school providing general, vocational or technical education on any level from primary to upper secondary or a national school consortium which can apply on behalf of a number of schools, for example, local or regional authorities, school coordinating bodies uh, or a social enterprise or, or other organisations with a role in the field of school education. And as for participants, any pupil enrolled in an eligible school or college in the UK or a British overseas territory where the minimum age for short term mobilities, three days to two months would be four years old. The, the minimum age for long term mobilities, i.e. longer than two months is 14. Appropriate safeguarding rules should be adhered to if mobilities involve pupils under the age of 18. Pupils do not need to be UK nationals to be eligible for the scheme and there's no minimum or maximum number of participants per project. Eligible activities uh, can include short term placements. Probably the most common for schools would be from three days to two months, so lots of flexibility. Pupils can travel with their teachers and work together in the classroom 
with pupils from another school um, in another country on project activities that support their learning and development. So for example, soft skills, language skills and academic attainment. So there's a wide range of activities and themes you can work on there to suit your school needs. These placements provide international learning experiences, giving an understanding of culture and language and helps pupils personal development. Long term placements, two to six months, they're only possible for pupils 14 and over, um, where they can have a placement at a partner school, attend lessons, live with a host family and have an immersive experience in the daily life of the receiving school. The sending and hosting schools are expected to ensure high quality learning outcomes to provide appropriate recognition for the involved pupils and constantly support them during their time abroad. This includes funding for accompanying staff to chaperone participants where necessary as part of safeguarding or duty of care. But mind, the mobility is mainly geared towards the pupils' experiences. Grant rates. So organisational support covers the costs linked to your admin and implementation of a placement. The figures are there and uh, it's £315 per participant for the first 100 and then it goes down from there. Cost of living, that's provided for the general cost of living for each participant. Pupils and accompanying staff on a school placement will get £53 per day for the first 14 days for any destination and then it goes uh, down to £37 per day from the 15th day onwards. Travel is funded um, and this is calculated on the distance between the host destination school, <coughs> sorry, the host and destination school and will support the cost of the round trip. It's calculated automatically based on where you're going. And widening participation. This is this is obviously one of the big features and priorities of the Turing scheme. So we need to talk about that in terms of funding. Um, it's where we want to ensure opportunities are available for learners who are traditionally underrepresented in international mobility programmes. These include participants from disadvantaged background or those with additional learning, sorry, additional educational needs. There is a specific qualitative question on widening participation. We're going to cover that in more detail later today. Additional funding is available to support pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds and those with special educational needs and disabilities, SEND. Additional costs for disadvantaged participants. School participants from disadvantaged backgrounds can receive additional actual costs for additional travel expenses. Exceptional costs are calculated on an actual cost basis and are specifically for any additional costs incurred to support the participation of disadvantaged participants. Funding covers costs such as passports, visa, insurance, appropriate clothes, luggage is necessary. Special educational needs and disabilities. So this term SEND refers to those learners, including those whose special educational needs arise because they have a long term disability that has a substantial and long term effect on the ability to do everyday normal tasks and we've got a list there of the uh, definition to be clear on on who is affected there. Additional SEND funding for participants with SEND, the scheme will fund up to 100% of actual costs for support directly related to their additional needs. The funding will also cover pre-mobility visits in order to carry out risk assessments and ensure participants 
will be able to equally access and take part in all elements of a placement. These pre-visits can be for a maximum duration of three days and funding can be used for both learners and accompanying staff. But pre-visits might are not available for any other purpose. Now, I'm going to move into the qualitative sections of the application form next, but this is a big section, so I'm going to stop part way through so we can open up for questions and answers so far, um, but I'll begin. So in the qualitative sections, the sections which are scored, we're going to take a look. So we have positive impact, international engagement, design of project plan and widening participation. Positive impact, this section is all about demonstrating how your project will help to drive positive impact and value for money. There are four questions uh, with a maximum word count of 500 words per question. And then we look at for positive impact, the aims and objectives, learning outcomes, further impact, continuous improvement and value for money. You see on the screen there that we've got the assessors assessment criteria. Um, the main thing just to take away from this is that the rating for the rating for positive impact, this section is up to a maximum of 30 points from a total of 100. So it's a big section. So here you'll be asked to describe your project's aims and objectives and how the planned activities will contribute to achieving those. Your response should clearly show how these activities relate to your school's current priorities. You should also ensure that the project objectives are relevant to the Turing scheme policy priorities. Those being Global Britain levelling up, developing key skills and the value for UK taxpayers. Please include specific info about your school's needs, plans for international engagement activities and the strategic development goals. These should be directly linked to your project activities. The planned activities should be relevant for both the individual participants and for your school as a whole. Further impact. You'll need to dis 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 sorry, <laughs> you'll need to de demonstrate how your project will impact and benefit participants. This section should describe the likely impact on participants in areas such as educational attainment, social mobility, soft skills, exposure to new ideas, research, innovation, which will be developed as a result of the project and with a view to improving participants' personal development and future career prospects. You should describe the types of participants that are expected to be involved in the project and identify their needs. You should also show how the project outputs in these areas linked to and address the identified needs of the participants. You might want to include examples such as improved knowledge, changes in attitude or behaviour. And these outcomes may have a further impact on participants' employee status, ability to access further education, well-being or lifestyle. Alan, um, hold on a second because the screen yes. has stopped sharing, so I'm just trying to fix that at the moment. Thank you. I think you should be back up now. Thanks very much, Irene. <laughs> So we're talking about how uh, participants uh, are expected to be involved in the project and we identify their needs and show how the project outputs in these areas link to and address those needs. Uh, we talked about examples um, of such as improved knowledge and skills, changes in behaviour and so on. And last of all, we just wanted to cover here um, a useful tip when it comes to measuring impact 
and that is the use of a tool called SMART, which is which stands for putting your answers into context where it's specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time bound. Learning outcomes. So in this section, you need to demonstrate what learning outcomes you expect participants to gain as a result of their involvement in the project and show how you would maybe assess and recognise these outcomes. So please describe the expected outcomes for participants and uh, a clear description of the needs of the project, uh, which the project will address and how the activities will address them and how the outcomes will be verified and measured. Please consider carefully how the learning outcomes meet the needs of the learners and are consistent with your overall project aims and objectives. For longer term activities, you could address how the extra duration represents value for money and how the learners would achieve higher level or different competences compared to a shorter term placement. Continuous improvement here <clears throat> determines is how you will determine whether a mobility placement has met the required aims. And you should also explain how you'll identify any areas for improvement to drive standards for future mobilities. So please describe how you plan to evaluate the outcomes of your project, in particular the quality of the mobility placement and how you'll ensure its lasting impact. You will need to demonstrate the evaluation activities that will take place to determine whether the project has achieved its objectives. And remember, evaluation is an ongoing process incorporated into your project management processes to help establish baselines and highlight areas for quality management. For example, evaluation may take place after the first activities to see if any improvements can be made for the following ones. Value for money. The section should be used to demonstrate how funding from the scheme will offer new or additional opportunities that your school has not previously been able to access. You can include information on why the proposed activity would not be possible without this funding. Um, you should provide detail of any economic benefit the project will provide to your organisation, school, participants in the short, medium and long term. Your application should provide clear evidence of the benefit of Turing funding to both your school and participants. So that's the first of these four qualitative criteria. We do have more, but I'm going to stop now as I've been talking for around 20 minutes and I just want to see if we've got any uh, popular featured questions so far that we want to highlight and go into with the team. So thanks and we'll just split for a short period to look at those. Hi, so yeah, we do have quite a lot of questions coming in, which is really nice to see. Um, I've kind of split them into two themes. We're also busy in the chat replying to the rest, but the first one is about consortium applications and within this kind of theme, we have had a few questions. So for example, can schools be part of a consortium application and submit their own as well? Thanks, Irene. Um, that's a really good question. That's one we're going to have to take away um, to try and get confirmation on. Any just to, just another any uh, any questions that we can't ask today, um, we will try and get answers for and um, and send you the answers to those along with the slides uh, when we do get in touch with you post event. Uh, but that is a very good question, and we will uh, we will need to take that one away. Thanks, Sean. Um, the next one also within that theme is does the consortium um, lead have to name all the participating schools, both in terms of sending and host schools? That's also a good question. In terms of host schools, we wouldn't expect you um, to necessarily include those because we understand that um, not everyone applying at this stage uh, has those partnerships. Um, has those partnerships in place. And what was the first part of the question? Sorry, Irene. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, if all the sending, um, all the schools that will be sent away for a mobility would need to be named as well as part oh, of right, the consortium yeah. application. Well, as, um, 
as part of your application, you, you should be trying to demonstrate um, perhaps, you know, your aims and objectives as part of the project. And presumably you would be selecting schools around those aims and objectives. So we probably would be looking to, um, you know, as part of consortium, if you would in look, if you would look to include details on the schools involved, because presumably there would be some link between the overall project aims and the actual schools that are being selected. Great, thank you. Um, another one that came under consortium was, um, do, do we know if they need to complete any additional documents such as um, mandates, for example? In terms of agreements, it's completely flexible. Um, so there aren't any um, specific requirements around agreements between um, sending and host organisations. Um, so it's essentially, you know, what, what you want to have in place that are, that's appropriate to your needs. Um, there's also some further information around safeguarding. So we have a couple of questions on those as well and um, any work that you need to do around those, uh, around the safeguarding uh, needs. So the programme guide has all the details you need for those. But in terms of more general agreements, it's completely flexible to your needs. Great, thank you. Um, and also, this was under consortium, but I think it would apply to, to the other um, type of applications as well is, is there a cap on the number of mobilities you can include or the number of participants you can include in one application or is it a max uh, is there a maximum budget no there isn't so um essentially we want people to give their you know their best estimate of what of um the number of participants that they can include so no there isn't a limit um getting into a more kind of technical side of things in terms of the application itself um, you'll be choosing activities based on months uh, where you have activities starting. So in that sense, you can choose up to 12 activities to represent each month of the year. But within those months, then you can choose an unlimited amount of uh, mobilities or activities. Thank you. And just the last question, and this is outside of consortium. Uh, I'm sure we have a lot more that I'll collect for later. Um, are there any kind of partner finding tools that we can advise? Will the um, British Council offices in other countries help find partners? Do we have anything like that? Any advice? Uh, there is a British Council um, tool for partner finding we can use. Um, as part of the tourism scheme, we're not taking an active, um, um, we're not actively involved in helping set up partnerships, but we can signpost you to um, some partner finding tools um, and we can share those in the chat and also in, in our follow up emails as well. Thank you. Um, Anna, I think if you want to go on and I'll call it a few more for later. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for the questions and thanks for the, the those uh, replies um, there. Yes, um, we have a uh, yeah, bit of time now so we can go forward on to the next area of the criteria, which is international engagement. Um, so let's look at that and see how it's broken down into four sub questions. And again, these are 500 word limits per question. And the rate and the yeah, the weighting for this section is 20 up to 20 points out of a maximum of 100. So international scope. <clears throat> We're looking to see how you explain that, you know, how the planned outcomes of the project will help you to achieve. <clears throat> Sorry, bear with me. Help you to achieve your school's international strategy. And the specific elements of that. You'll also need to set out how participants will share the knowledge and skills gained during and after the international activities. So be clear on how the knowledge, skills and so on will be integrated into everyday activities in your school or the community uh, and so on. Next part is called partnership facilitation, it's kind of something we just touched on in the chat there. Um, so this section is about how, you're, how the project could uh, en enhance current partnerships. If you have existing relationships internationally with overseas partners or under whether the project will help you to create links with new partners globally. So please explain how your project will help you to develop these links 
and you should provide details of any existing or potential partners and what benefit they bring to your school, your learners and so on. And as, as we were saying, if you don't have any existing links or are looking for new links, uh, you can use the British Council's partner finding tool and the link shown there on the screen um, where you can register to find partner schools to work with in different countries. So this is uh, this uh, part about justifying the partnership and location. So it's it's looking for you to provide a clear explanation of, of why you've chosen the specific partner and locations proposed and explain how these locations and partnerships will help you to meet your objectives. So there's clear rationale there. You may have a, a an interesting, you know, outdoor learning um, and you may look at Scandinavia who are uh, well ahead of the field in those terms and you may wish to base a project around that area where maybe the 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 kids could go on a treasure hunt activity in the woods with um, you know working collaboratively to solve tasks and so on um, that that's the kind of thing you might think about in terms of why you ch choose a, a partner in Scandinavia for example Please be aware that your activities should demonstrate a greater potential value than similar opportunities offered in the UK and should contribute to increasing the international dimension. <clears throat> and we recommend that you provide further info about the history of your proposed partnership or partnerships and where possible further details of your partnership. There should be a coherent link between Turing scheme objectives and your project objectives. Again, that's got to be clear and and also on the composition of the partnership. OK, partnership rules. So this section is looking at the rules uh, within the partnership and how you'll successfully work together as a team to achieve your objectives. So explaining the role of each partner in the project and how these responsibilities have been assigned amongst the different partner organisations. So this is say, more relevant when you have a consortium. Uh, this is important because your proposal should show a balance in responsibilities based on capacity and expertise, but should focus on quality project delivery. If possible, try and include info about what each of the partners will bring to the project in terms of their skills and experience, making the most of your skills here. If the roles and responsibilities are still to be decided, please just provide detail on how this will eventually be agreed. You should provide clear reasoning on why you've chosen these specific partnerships and locations and how the activities will address those needs and achieve your objectives. And lastly, just remember, uh, you know, to explain how your partnerships will be monitored during the project and how will you communicate with the partners and how you'll evaluate success. Right, so we're now into the next section of the qualitative part of the form which is about the design of project plan and it's covered in four areas again the four areas will have a word count of a maximum of 500 words and we'll go into practical arrangements first of all uh, oh yeah and bear in mind yeah so this is a section worth 20 up to 20 up to a maximum of 100 So practical uh, arrangements um, is where you provide uh, the details about the mobilities and how you'll support participants. So outline any practical arrangements such as the tr for the travel and accommodation and include any info about potential risks and how they can be mitigated. You should demonstrate how you'll provide appropriate support to learners with fewer opportunities or additional educational needs. The project plan will provide you with a projection of anticipated, sorry, anticipated mobility activity across the life cycle of the project, and it will be automatically generated within the application form once you've completed your activity section. This will show you the schedule of all the planned mobility activities to happen. Performance monitoring. This is where we're asking you to describe 
how you plan to monitor the performance against the plan at all stages of a project's life cycle. So in the prep, the implementation and the follow up. And this could include how you'll measure progress, what you know and what monitoring activities would, would take place and, and how often. So you may include things like, um, you know, regular uh, meetings via, uh, you know, Skype, for example, or whatever tool you use to check in on the progress uh, of the activity. So it's very much trying to get a, a, a blended learning approach, I guess, or, a, you know, a blended uh, type of uh, working where you're using all the virtual web tools you can to supplement and to help you build up to the to the final stage of the project, probably where mobility is happening. Because I get, I imagine in schools, because of safeguarding and because if it's new partnerships, you will need a good portion of your project time in the build up stages to prepare for when the magic happens in the actual uh, travel. OK, so we're going to go on to now preparation. So there's, this is where you will highlight how you'll prepare for the mobilities uh, to ensure that individuals needs are met and the project meets its overall objectives. So make sure everyone's fully prepared So describe the practical and logistical support that participants are going to need before they travel and explain who will arrange the travel, insurance, visas and accommodation. It's important that preparation is relevant to the target group and it takes place in the UK prior to their departure. And you'll also need to explain how you'll gather feedback from them in relation to their mobility experience. So let's look at learner feedback. So you'll outline how the feedback will feed into your school's future activity and how you'll review the feedback to ensure continuous improvement in the future. You should describe how feedback received from the participants following their experience would be captured and used. And participant feedback should be incorporated into your evaluation strategy, which should be an ongoing process, like we said. Uh, for example, feedback should take place in the first, after the first flow of activities to see if any improvements can be made for the next flow. And do outline your feedback methods, providing a methodology as to how you collect data. And importantly, you should describe how you will maintain contact with the participants after they've completed their international activity. So we come to widening participation, which is uh, there's a lot of information about this, and this is very key to Turing as an inclusive scheme. So here you'll see the criteria. It's 30 points, so it's it's heavily weighted. And we'll talk about disadvantaged learners first. So the first question we'll ask to describe how the project will include learners who are underrepresented in the national mobility pro programmes, such as those with fewer opportunities and additional needs. So use this section to define the groups of learners you have, you've identified, and explain why these target groups or group is relevant in your project goals. And you can find a full definition of widening participation target groups on uh, page 39 of the Turing programme guide. OK, now we'll look at the promoting your project. So this question asks you to provide info about how you'll promote the opportunities available to the learners from a widening participation background. How are you going to ensure that the selection process is fair and offers equal access to mobility placements for all learners? Use this section to outline how you'll identify and recruit them from a widening participation background. And you can include info about promotional campaigns, maybe how you'd communicate to these groups and likely timeframes for that to happen. Please explain how you'll select your participants and ensure fair and transparent selection process. And, um, and what the criteria would be to ensure you could recruit participants from a disadvantaged background, <coughs> excuse me, or those with additional learning needs. Ideas might include asking potential participants to complete an application form or, or write a letter of interest. Use this section to identify any potential challenges to participation 
of disadvantaged learners or those with additional educational needs and include what measures you will put in place to overcome any barriers that they might face. And then a bit about supporting these underrepresented participants. So how are you going to support disadvantaged participants? Um, those from these underrepresented groups or those ad additional educational needs while they're on their mobility placement. So you should ensure there's a clear approach to supporting participants with these needs, for example, ensuring host venues and accommodation are suitable and making sure how you explain that their needs will be met and describe what measures you'll take, for example, how you'll arrange suitable accommodation for an activity. Additional support can be critical to ensuring people from disadvantaged backgrounds benefit the most from their international activities. And it's therefore imperative that organisations and schools and so on, working with these people from these backgrounds, use extra resources to support them fully. OK, so we're coming to the end of the qualitative sections. Just to go over what we mean by activity and and what organisational support looks like in a bit more detail. So there are uh, also narrative sections uh, here where you'll need to write a narrative for each month where activity starts. You'll see on the slide here th the guidance for these two sections. <clears throat> Oops, sorry, back, up, back we go. And yeah, you, can, you may not be able to see the full screen, but I will read this out anyway. Um, so please note um, the answers that you give here are, are, are assessed as part of the value for money criteria. And if you have multiple activities, it's OK to use bullet points in the narrative here. And you can also refer back to other narrative answers if necessary. But please be clear which section you're referring to if you do this. So, for example, we're talking about things like exceptional travel funding and justification um, for, for why it's needed. So, final points to consider um, as a whole. Um, good practice, I guess, good advice is probably to work on the narrative of your application offline. Um, there, I think there is a 30 minute timeout on the online form, so be careful of that. Um, but so you can absolutely work offline um, on a Google, on a you know, Word document or whatever platform it is. But just be mindful and be mindful of the word count for each section. Do research and understand that the key strategic aims of Turing, like I mentioned, Global Britain levelling up, developing key skills and value for UK taxpayers, um, and, and how these are linked to your own strategies and refer to the, the guide throughout and reach out to other departments or academic schools and so on, particularly when bid, the bid is, su is subject specific or targeting specific groups of students. And of course, ask someone else to be your critical friend, your second pair of eyes um, uh, to proofread your, your form. So, we're now coming to the final part of today um, before the Q&A and it's just to go through applications. So the deadline for schools is Friday 7th May uh, 12 noon. The full application guidance is going to be, uh, sorry, it well, is available on the Turing website um, and you can make an application through the website um, through what we'll call, we call the application portal. And what it will also allow you to do is track how your application's going as well as manage your grant payments um, through what we call the live reporting tool. Because ensuring your payments will be um, triggered at the point of need. Um, so not as maybe you might have remembered in previous schemes such as Erasmus and so on that we've We've operated where there's a pre-financing payment and a payment at the end. It's payment as required, um, but there'll be more detail on that in our guidance. Um, we will be running uh, three uh, application support webinars for schools. So this has been the very first one, but we'll have a further one on the 30th of March, which is repeated. 
and again on the 8th of April if anyone else wants to take advantage of the, the opportunity. Um, and then the application form just to say, well, it's going to ask, you know, to provide an overview of their project, including details about the activities, how you choose, how you choose participants, the budget, your organisation details and, and, you know, the legal name and address and so on. So we, prov pr we prove your eligibility. OK, once um, you can see there that, you know, there's a range of uh, resources which are all on the website. Um, so before you start your application, just another reminder, do familiarise yourself with the programme guide and the application guidance that goes with. And there's also a FAQ document that you might find useful too. And registering to apply. So just, just technical things here, but once you've registered, on the application portal, you'll be able to complete your application and so on, like we said. And whether it's your first time to visit the portal or not, you will always land on the, this login page on the screen that prompts you to insert your username and password. To set up your account, you simply insert an email address and you click on register a new user. Please note that people who you may want to share your application with from your school or in your consortium, will uh, with they will also need to go through this step too to have an account um, we do have a useful video tutorial now up on the choosing scheme youtube channel which does have step-by-step -step guidance for submitting a school's application focused on the technical aspects of the application form Further support. Um, so, you know, if you find that there's a query that you, you, you can't find the answer to, um, you want to explore something in, in the development of your project, then use the help desk. So that's tutoring.scheme at BritishCouncil.org. That's for schools. We also manage higher education there. Um, sign up for the online newsletter to stay up to date. And uh, like I mentioned before, there are going to be webinars still to happen and um, more going on uh, as the scheme develops. So now we come to the end um, where we open up again to questions um, to see um, what you're thinking about now and, and how we can help you further with the rest of the time we've got. So I'll, I'll stop now. Thanks for, you know, thanks for your attention. I appreciate there's a lot of info there, but um, it's the first time we've run these. So Appreciate any feedback you give us and Sean's going to include a feedback link in the chat towards the end. Appreciate that and um, we'll do our best to keep giving you quality support. So at this stage, yeah, over to the Q&A and just let's see what uh, what answers we can give you. Thank you. Hello again, Alan. Um, just for everyone, we are working our way through a very, very high um, volume of questions. So if we haven't got to yours yet, we will get there. We just work um, making our way through them. Um, but yeah, just to start with some of the common themes or the ones that I've seen a few times. Um, going back to widening participation, um, is there a minimum um, percentage of widening participation um, or disadvantaged participants? No, there's not a minimum percentage, no. So uh, again, there's, there's flexibility on that. Uh, will widening participation application, applications be fav uh, favoured or scored higher? I replied to this in the chat, but I'll say it out loud as well. Okay. Obviously, levelling up and widening participation are one of the different um, criteria for, for this application form. So you will obviously need to show that you're addressing the different points and the different criteria and that your application meets the programme objectives as well. So. Um, yes, they will probably be scored higher because it's one of the, the assessment criteria. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's very much a focus of the touring scheme. So we are looking for applications that demonstrate, um, you know, that that is a focus in, as part of their project. Yeah. Um, will newcomers, so schools that have never taken part in international activities, be benefited in any way? Will they give, be given extra points, anything like that? I think it's all to do with how you can demonstrate the value of the of the activity that you're applying for. Um, again, in terms of how it's assessed, you know, we, I, I'd really try and familiarise yourself with the uh, assessment criteria in the programme guide. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, if 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 you can demonstrate likely impact, 
Um, that's the most important part of your of your application as well as obviously the value for many and the other assessment criteria. Um, but from the context you're asking from, no, I think as, as, as long as you can demonstrate the, the value in the activity uh, and the likely impact, that's what we're looking for. Brilliant, thank you. Um, now moving on to some of more practical things. So in terms of trips, some of the questions that we've been asked quite a bit is about hosting institutions. So as far as I'm aware, is a school or college that provides um, formal education between three and 18, I think it is, Sean? Because we were being asked if we can, ha if someone can be hosted by a social enterprise that works with a range of schools or by a consortia um, that works with a range of schools. So it must be a school. So in terms of the, um, the we're talking about host organisations now, yeah? Yes. OK, so yeah. Um, it must be a non-UK school um, or in the case of applicants in British overseas territories outside of British overseas territory in question. Um, but it must be an institution providing either general, vocational or technical education. Um, but that can be any uh, any level, sorry, from primary to upper secondary education. Brilliant, thank you. Um, what else? Uh, another one is can, I'm, I'm just reading now, can I include more than one country um, within my application. So for example, if I wanted to organise trips to a few countries that I have um, established relationship with as part of this project, can I can I do that? Yeah, of course you can. I mean, again, you should try and you should be looking at maybe trying to demonstrate um, a sort of common threads between all these activities. So, you know, try and tie everything back into those aims and objectives uh, of your organisation and the project as a whole. Um, but yeah, there's there's no limit to the amount of kind of visits that you can that you can apply for in terms of funding. Um, again, more kind of technical guidance in terms of how you would complete that section and the activity section. Um, that will be available uh, as a uh, as a video uh, on the website. I think it's already available actually as of today. Um, but in terms of those details of how you would enter those in, uh, that information for the activities themselves, that video is the guidance that you would need. Brilliant, thank you. Um, another question that we've asked, and I think it might be um, one that we need to take away, but you might know the answer, is can um, some of the funding, so I'm thinking particularly or organisational support, be used to pay an organisation abroad to organise to organize or help organise things like risk assessments, um, DBS checks, things like that? Thanks, Irene. So, um, I mean, if a host school incurs costs associated with the administration, sorry, the ad administration and the implementation of a placement, um, then the applicant's organisation can choose to use organisational support towards these costs, but it's not intended to provide income to host schools beyond what is actually required to facilitate the, the exchange itself. And that's for host schools, not a third um, party to come and organise things, you mean, you say? Sorry, yeah, so um, that would be for a host school, yeah. Um, okay. But not for, yeah, not for a third party organisation. Thank you. Um, another question about OS, um, organisational support that is, uh, is does the £315 cover um, just students or do you get £315 as well for accompanying persons? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the, the words in the programme guide does suggest it's for all participants, but um, let us take that away and we'll try and confirm that as soon as we can in the next few days. Perfect. Um, one of the questions that I've seen as well, and I think I can answer this, is, is there a maximum or minimum of pupils? There is not a maximum of pupils, um, but there is a minimum because this is all about students going abroad, so you will definitely need to involve some students, um, but there's not that minimum of like 10 or something like that. Um, right, so I'm just reading through them. Um, some of the questions are if we don't know who our partner is going to be when we apply, um, how can we calculate travel cost and um, that that kind of thing? So do you want to take sure, that? No, that's, a, that's a fair question. Um, you know, if you if you have um, been involved in any kind of similar project in the past, we would look at maybe um, sort of kinds of estimating it on on uh, on past performance. Um, essentially, what what we're asking you to do is to give your best estimate that can be reduced further down the line. Um, 
but if you can give your high assessment for uh, for those costs, those actual costs, if you're if you don't have those costs to hand when you're estimating them, just bear in mind that they can be reduced further down the line, but they can't be added to. Great, thank you. Um, in terms of travel days, Alan mentioned that you can have travel days. Um, do we have a maximum of how many travel days can you, you can have? This is, yes. this is the case of someone that says they are quite far away from, from the airport, so it takes them a little bit of time to get from their school to the airport to then elsewhere. Hello. Hi, sorry. Yeah, I, I, um, I think we might need to take that one away. Um, in terms of travel days, um, yeah, let's take that one away. We'll, we will we'll respond to that one um, when we send the slides over to, to all attendees. Okay, brilliant. Um, can, do language schools count as a host institution? I think um, we answered the other one before, and is if it falls within that VET or school provider um, definition, I suppose. For the project plan, do we need to provide a day-to-day -day itinerary um, if we're moving from one school to another? No, so the project plan, again, this um, this is detailed in the in the application form guidance. Uh, the project plan is automatically generated from the information that you're inputting as part of your activities. Um, but just for the point of your question, no, you wouldn't need kind of day-to-day -day sort of detail. The project plan deals with sort of... Uh, with months where activities are starting. So in terms of specific dates, no, you wouldn't you wouldn't need that level of detail. Yeah, uh, Alan here as well. Yeah, I, I'd encourage you once you get get yourself familiar with the application form so that when you're you know you're in there and you see the project that you know the design plan, the project plan, the activities, you'll get a feel for what you can and can't do. And you can delete, you can edit before submission so you can play around with that you know, to see what's possible. So it's worth experimenting with it before and draft in your draft stage, I think. Yeah, it'll help. Um, I was just to add to that, just a reminder, and I'm sure Alan's mentioned it, but this is huge, is do not press submit until you're ready to submit because we can only accept the first and only submission uh, for your school first application. If you were applying for schools and vet, then you can submit one for each. But again, it's only the first Thanks, one. Thanks, Irene. Yeah, that's really important. Yeah, so just uh, stay away from that submit button, but uh, you can do everything else. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a tricky question uh, about linking a Turing project with an Erasmus project. So I think maybe we want to um, get back to you, Mick, separately, if that's okay. What was the question, Irene? Um, might be able to help. Okay, so could a Turing project link up with an overseas part uh, with overseas partners who are sharing an Erasmus Plus project? It depends how the funding is being used. Um, so essentially, you know, if if there are organisations already in receipt of Erasmus funding for certain types of activities, you couldn't then use Turing scheme funding on top for the same activity. So for um, so sort of double funding. However, you can be in receipt of Erasmus, um, uh, sorry, Erasmus funding for separate activities as long as the Turing scheme funding is being used um, for anything that isn't already funded by any other sources. I, I read it more as linking the Turing project to the Erasmus project so everyone gets funding, but yeah. Uh, thank you for that, Sean. Um, Will applications that have house schools identified be favoured above applications that do not have house schools identified? Um, no, that wouldn't be the case. I mean, as long as you uh, have a clear idea in mind of the types of host schools you want to work with, um, you know, you can provide justification for the types of hosts that, again, you're looking to work with ideally, um, then no, there, there wouldn't be any penalties um, around that. Brilliant. Um, another consortium question, um, as a consortium, does every school have to answer separately or do you answer as a consortium as a whole? So a joint response? Yeah, so it's so the application is uh, representative of the consortium, uh, this one single application. So um, you might nominate one person within the consortium to write the application. 
but uh, again this there's details of this in the in the application form guidance yeah. you can actually share your application with other individuals or other organizations within the, the consortium but there's no expectation for everyone to answer questions separately you know brilliant thank you um what happens if we can travel because of covid yeah that's an excellent question um i mean there will be flexibility um you know if if there are situations where people can't travel to the uh, to the locations they're bidding for what we would recommend at this stage is um again give your essentially apply for your ideal locations or where you would want to take where you would want those to take part and don't don't take um potential COVID restrictions into consideration when form your application because there will be flexibility further down the line um so obviously we've had people asking about Australia, for example, which, you know, with the borders are shut at the moment. If, you know, if Australia, for example, was the best um, best place where you could demonstrate that the activities would meet the aims and objectives, we would still recommend including that as your application, as an example. Brilliant. Um, does accommodation on mobilities have to be an exchange, so a host and family, or can students stay in host, um, hotels and hostels? As far as I know, we've never been involved in that. We just let people manage the, the project and how they arrange it as long as they follow safeguarding procedures. Is that right? That's right. As long as the activities themselves meet the criteria, um, you know the, the accommodation arrangements uh, arrangements sorry more flexible obviously if, if, as long as um the appropriate safeguarding measures are put in place as uh, outlined in the program guide brilliant um to tell what else do we have we've got so many questions sorry <laughs> uh, right do you need to go to another school's building or could you for example organize a joint residential with a school abroad at a venue for example, campsite activity center in the country where children could mix and be involved in lessons together. That's, that's very a, specific. Yeah, really good question. Um, again, that's when we'll uh, appreciate we're taking a few questions away, but we um, this is when we'll need to take away. And again, we we'll hope to uh, provide responses as soon as we can to all of these. Brilliant. Um, is there funding for consortium leads or um, slash members to travel as well as the teachers that are going with the pupils? And this, I, this isn't something that would be available. However, um, if this is something that you felt, you know, would would drive further impact for, you know, for any reason, then you could include it as part of your application. But it's not something that the touring scheme is designed for. Um, is it safe to assume that we can use the index of multiple deprivation as an additional measure of disadvantage? Eighty-two percent of my pupils. Uh, are imposed codes on the top 10% the, for deprivation, but only 60% are on free school meals. Sure, yeah, I mean, we appreciate that um, people will want to offer support, or school, sorry, will want to offer support to, um, to learners who don't meet our strict definition of disadvantaged, and we will offer some discretion in this case. Um, you would just need to make that, um, that clear as part of your bid. It would be really useful to see a chart outlining differences between Erasmus Plus and Turing. Does this exist? Um, not that we've produced as, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, this isn't something that's available. No. I guess you have to just look at, try and look at the scheme through fresh eyes, you know, and um, there's a lot of flexibility in the scheme, you know, in terms of the global reach and uh, the type of, uh, you know, the work you can do with your partner school. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a different, it's very different to get your head around it to start, but um, I think, you know, um, there's a lot of potential in the scheme and um, yeah, yeah, I think you should go for it anyway, you know, it's a, it's a learning journey. Yeah, yeah like it's, 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 it's the first year and it's an atypical year, which is why we've kind of left a lot of things flexible so people can kind of drive the project um, and the scheme itself in the first year. Um, and then obviously we can take feedback for the, you know, if there is a second year, but um, obviously the kinds of 
the lack of geographical restrictions can you know potentially widen um a lot of applicants international scope in a lot of ways with uh, with the opportunities on offer under the touring scheme yeah great um i think there's quite a few here that we will probably should put in writing or, to, or just consider for future guidance one of them for example being what happens if a school a partner school withdraws um from the project in a consortium bid could could this be reallocated to another school things like that and i'm I'm guessing all those things will come up when we write the project guidance and the project management guidance um, just for, for those projects that are successful and we can support them with that. Exactly. I think the, the, the that's is an ongoing discussion in terms of, um, you know, which categories you can do budget transfer from, etc. Um, but we understand, you know, again, that people will be estimating certain things and obviously, you know, the data will will change as um as these activities start but people will be able to report changes via live reporting but in terms of budget transfers specifically we don't have details on that for for now i'm afraid i think this was more about um and the next question is the same thing which is um naming the uk schools within a consortium and if one of them all of a sudden says i don't want to take part can you replace it by another uk school within that consortium um i mean to come in into that consortium do we do we know or is something we don't to... know for sure um i i mean i suspect that'll be fine as long as you can demonstrate the same uh, commitment to the aims and objectives but we'll take that away and we can confirm that as well yeah and at the application stage do they need to name all schools or should they just name as much as they can or will provide guidance in the future well again i mean if presumably that you know the, the schools that part of the consortium are you know a part of the consortium for a reason so we probably would look or you know if 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 you really want to strengthen your application, you would be giving reasons as to why you've chosen particular schools. So it's not um, it's not mandatory that you would list all of them, but we would encourage people to think about, you know, giving reasons as to why they are including those schools, in which case they would need to have those details to hand. Brilliant, thank you. Um, just moving on, I'm going to just pick a few now because I'm conscious of the time. Um, but is there a an application form offline, a template offline that we could work from and then before we access the online version. No, there's not. Um, you will need to go to the online version to to be able to work on it. We um, recommend perhaps um, maybe just working on the, you know, on the form, maybe copying the the questions onto a Word document and doing it yeah. that way. Because um, we can, you know, we understand in terms of once you press the submitted uh, the submit button, that's that's kind of it for the application. So perhaps, yeah, if 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 you want to work on Word offline, that's fine, and then input um, you know what you've written in the narrative sections afterwards. Um, but no, they, 